Okay, so the question at hand is, should you narrate your own audio book? And the answer is that depends. So we're gonna talk about why that is. Um, there are a lot of factors to consider when you are thinking about editing your own audio book. Here are some of them. The purpose for doing it, if I said editing your own audio book, I meant narrating your own audio book. The purpose for doing it, we're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to talk about the market for audiobooks very briefly. We're going to talk about talent and stamina, technical skill level, and financial considerations. And I'm hoping that if you have questions, you can type them into the chat. At the end of the presentation, we'll come back and we'll look at the questions and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. And if we don't get to all of them, then I'll simply answer them via email through Ann. So the question you have to consider is, how is narrating your own audiobook going to fill your audience's need? Because no matter what you're creating, you've got to be thinking about your audience, whether it's poetry, uh, short stories, fiction, technical books, whatever it is, you're writing for a purpose to fill a need, right? So you want to be thinking about that need. Let's take a look at why um, um, you might want to narrate your own audio book. And this is, a, let me point something out here. I don't do narration much anymore because I can't talk straight. <laughs> Drives me crazy. But here are some of the purposes that you might consider um, to sell more books, to learn to be a narrator, to have fun, uh, some or all of the above. So clearly defining your purpose for narration will get you off to a good start because it'll help you focus on that. Now, if you're just doing it for fun and you're doing it for friends and family, that's as good a reason as any. And we'll get back to that here uh, in a moment. But let's talk about target markets, if you're interested in that. Think about why people listen to audiobooks. Workers or employees or office people may listen during a commute. They want to uh, learn something, perhaps. Students, some students learn better by listening than they do by visualization. Of course, we know about learning styles, right? Senior citizens may be trying to avoid eye strain. I know that I get eye strain periodically by uh, staring at a screen if I have to for too long. Busy mothers might be wanting to entertain themselves while they're multitasking. I was talking to a lady yesterday who said, I was nursing a baby, cooking and on the phone at the same time. So this is a, a valid reason for creating an audio book to help entertain those people who are doing three or four things at once. So the question is, can you meet their needs by narrating your own audio book? It's something to consider, but if you're still just doing it for fun, maybe that's not a relevant question, but it's something to consider. The thing you need to understand is that narrating a book is hard. It takes a lot of time and it needs to be done in as few sessions as possible. The reason for this is continuity. If you were to do a recording in the morning and then come back to it in the afternoon, you may not have the same voice quality and there may be a distinct difference in the two sessions that the, that the listener can hear. But a voice actor will have a comfortable place to work, either at home or in a studio. She'll take care of her voice or he will take care of his voice. By that, I mean that there are very specific things that you need to do to keep your voice in good shape. Uh, your voice is much like your muscles. It's something that has to be exercised, but you don't want to strain it. Otherwise, the quality of your voice can affect your narration. Voice actors will op often, uh, before they start the day, listen to the previous day's recording to get in the groove to be able to match the same tone, the same speed, and the same voice quality that they had previous on the previous day. And voice actors typically narrate about six hours a day. Uh, six hours a day. That's why I don't narrate anymore. I can't talk. 
but they do it for long stretches at a time. And we'll, we'll uh, talk about that in a second. It, well, we'll talk about it right now. So if you want to test whether or not you have the ability to narrate your book, pull a book in your genre off the shelf, set up your computer or phone to record your narration, get comfortable in your favorite chair, and read aloud for 55 minutes. Now you can take breaks during that to sip water, and you should every five or 10 minutes, but then take a five minute break and come back and do it again, and then do it a third time. Then ask yourself, are you having fun? <laughs> if your answer is no, you might consider hiring a voice actor. Now I'm speaking in terms of high quality narration here. If you're just doing it for fun, you don't need to worry so much about this stuff. But if you're really intent on putting a book out there that'll be purchased and read and shared, then you wanna think about these things. Let's test your, your manuscript, okay? Prose does not necessarily narrate well. There's a real famous audio clip, H.G. Wells trying to narrate a promotional piece and he starts reading it and he stops, he stumbles over words, he stops again, he stumbles over some more words and then he says, who in the hell wrote this? <laughs> and it's pretty funny, but it shows that prose does not necessarily narrate well. And as a consequence, uh, voice actors will often suggest edits to make uh, narration more smooth, okay? So plan on editing your manuscript. If it reads smoothly when you read it, then a voice actor would be able to read it. So here's a little idea for you. Do a recording test. Once your manuscript reads well, and by manuscript, I mean a short story, a chapter in a book, a poem, whatever it is, then record it and listen to it while you're reading your manuscript along with your own voice, okay? Do you hear yourself gasping for breath? Are you doing that? Are you going every time you need to draw a breath? Are there clicks in your voice from a dry mouth? Anne can tell you about that. She suffers from that. Did you read the words that were written on the page? Did you read them correctly? Did you say lead instead of See, there you go. There's a little hiccup right there. Did you say lead instead of lead? Did you stumble over words? Does your voice sound appropriate for the text? Is it excited? Is it pleasant? Is it entertaining or enthusiastic? And did you hear background noise from your neighborhood, from your clothing, from turning pages, from your dog barking? traffic, neighbors, trains, aircraft. I have a train track about a quarter mile from my house. And so if there's something that I'm doing that, that is interrupted by a train, then I want to just stop and wait till the train goes by and start again. That might require repeating, but that's okay because you can edit out the problem later on. I talked with one uh, professional voice actor who said that she lives near an airport and so she keeps her ear tuned for aircraft and if she hears a jet coming over she just stops and waits so there are little things that you have to do to adjust for uh, the neighborhood around you if you live out in the country you are in great shape because that tends to be much more uh, conducive to narration because it's so much quieter I've lived on two different acreages. I love being on acreage. I'm not there now. And so if in the middle of this presentation, you hear a police siren go by my door, you'll know why. So another thing to keep in mind is that audiobook narration is acting, okay? The best professional narrators are often stage or um, movie actors. They use inflection, accent, timing, pitch, volume, and other voice characteristics. They use accents, uh, different voices, and think of Mel Blanc and all of the cartoon characters that he used to be able to do. 
And by doing these things, they can make a story come alive. So as you're narrating your story, can you differentiate in your voice between characters? Do you have a lot of characters that need to sound a little bit different so that your audience knows that it's a different person talking? So that's a thing to consider. A professional narrator or voice actor, and those terms are kind of interchangeable, uh, can also make even technical books or history or biography come alive because of the way that they manage their voices. So let's listen to some of this, okay? I'm gonna play two cuts, two different voice actors reading the same paragraph from a book called The Best Christmas Pageant Ever. And I wanna illustrate a couple of things. First of all, while voice quality is important, it is not as important as storytelling ability, okay? Now, one of these, the first recording we'll listen to was done with analog technology probably 30 or 40 years ago. The second one is done with digital technology, so they're going to sound quite different. But let's hear the first one and listen to how she reads. Uh, if you have trouble understanding what she says, it's probably the electronics that we're using. But listen to how she reads this, okay? Elaine Stritch. Now, notice also that these two readings are almost identical in the length of time that they take to read. So here we go with Elaine. There was also a sign in the yard that said, beware of the cat. You kids always laughed about that till they got to look at the cat. It was the meanest looking animal I ever saw. It had one short leg and a broken tail and one missing eye. And the mailman wouldn't deliver anything to the herdman because of it. I don't know if you're familiar with the best Christmas pageant ever, but it's a story about a family called the Herdmans. And they're quite a family. If you ever get a chance to read it or listen to the audio, audio book, do it. Second one, CJ Crit. There was also a sign in the yard that said, beware of the cat. New kids always laughed about that till they got a look at the cat. It was the meanest looking animal I ever saw. It had one short leg and a broken tail and one missing eye. And the mailman wouldn't deliver anything to the Herdman's because of it. So there you have it. Two different narrators reading the same book. Both of them have excellent storytelling qualities. Both of them have excellent voices. Now, Elaine Stritch was elderly when she recorded this. And if you listen to the recording with you, headphones she's delightful to listen to because you can just feel yourself going back in time to when she was a girl and enjoying the story that she's telling so that's why i say storytelling ability is really more important than voice quality because as an elderly person her voice quality was beginning to get a little bit worn out right cj crit on the other hand is crystal clear as she reads but she also uses all of those skills that I mentioned earlier, like inflection and, and volume and all of those characteristics that a narrator can do really well. So what kinds of books work well when they're narrated by authors? When we first got on, I think Dwayne was the one who, who started talking about poetry. Poetry should always be read by the person who wrote it. Um, I had a very hard lesson when I was in college, when I tried to perform in a kind of a talent show by reading my roommate's poetry, and a girl in the audience said something rather mean to me. You should have let him read his own poetry. He didn't want to, and I didn't do it very well. But my lesson that I learned from that was, if you have poetry, read it yourself because you're the one who knows best what you're trying to say. Other stories, maybe not so much, but poetry really should be done by yourself. Now, Anne, don't get upset with me. I'm gonna say memoirs, because that's the way my mother taught me to say the word rather than memoirs. Memoirs and personal or family stories are best told by the author. 
for the reasons that poetry is. Professional advice, if you are an experienced public speaker, which also trains you to uh, use your voice well, or business books about your own business methods, consider, I don't know if you're familiar with Stephen Covey and the Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, but he very often narrated portions of his books and he was very good at doing so because they were his, they were his ideas. Now, if you have a book that you want narrated, but you're not sure whether you can do it, or if it is fiction or business books about theory or practices or academic or technical books, history, biography, those things are best done by a professional voice actor or a professional narrator, simply because of the trained voice. Uh, I'm not trying to discourage anyone that has written fiction from narrating, but just consider that, okay? Now we're going to go back to the best Christmas pageant ever, and we're going to listen to two different recordings, one done in a studio and one done right here in my office. I did both of them, but I want you to hear the different characteristics in recording, and we'll talk about why they are the way they are here in a moment. The first recording is done in a studio with a $1,200 microphone dedicated to, uh, it, well, let's see, I can't even describe it. It's dedicated to voice work, okay? That's the best way I can put it. It's the kind of microphone that you see singers sing in when they've got the thing right up to their mouth. They're practically swallowing it. And it's done in a soundproof booth. And we'll talk about why that is here in a moment. But the second one, was done right here in my office with the $29 USB microphone and all of the room's ambiance around it. Okay, so first, here's the first one. There was also a sign in the yard that said, beware of the cat. New kids always laughed about that till they got a look at the cat. It was the meanest looking animal I ever saw. It had one short leg and a broken tail and one missing eye and the mailman wouldn't deliver anything to the herdmans because of it. Okay, that's in a studio. Now listen to this one done in my office. There was also a sign in the yard that said, beware of the cat. New kids always laughed about that till they got a look at the cat. It was the meanest looking animal I ever saw. It had one short leg and a broken tail and one missing eye. And the mailman wouldn't deliver anything to the herdmans because of it. Now that second recording has background noise in it. I don't know if you can hear it, but when you get the slide set, you can listen to it and you'll be able to hear the background hum of my computer sitting right here. There were a couple of other noises in there. You wouldn't think that the average person would hear those kinds of things, but they do. And it causes them to be a little bit judgmental about the narration. Consequently, a narration should be flat. There should be no background sound at all. So how do you achieve that if you're recording your own book and you're doing it at home? Well, you've got to create your own soundproof booth. I talked, that lady that I talked with that uh, lived near an airport was actually recording in her clothes closet. <laughs> because the clothes muffled the sound really well. And so you can do some pretty ingenious, cheap things to, to narrate uh, a flat file without spending a lot of money building a studio. But if you wanna spend a little money and you have the room to do it, you can, uh, you can build a little studio and I'll show you about that here in a minute. But one of the things to keep in mind is that as you narrate, you will make mistakes. If you catch yourself making a mistake, you just stop. And then you repeat the same thing. You just back up a sentence or to the beginning of the paragraph because you're going to be able to cut those mistakes out during the editing process, okay? Now, Let's take a 
look at um, the idea of recording in your closet, okay? So imagine yourself spending hours among the hangers. Can you handle that? This is kind of a mental uh, characteristic that you need to think about. Can you handle being in your closet for several hours at a time? So if you want to try it, you can go back to the stamina test where you take a book off the shelf, sit down and, and read it out loud, aloud for 55 minutes. Try that in your closet. See how it works for you. And if you can do it, go for it. But if you're going to do it in a spare room, if you want to dedicate a spare room to it, you can do it with very little space. It doesn't take a lot of space at all. At all. This is a, kind of a schematic diagram or floor plan of my uh, office. And you'll notice that three or four, one, two, three, the top, bottom, and right hand walls are interior walls. The left hand wall is an exterior wall with a big window in it. So if I were going to create a recording studio here, I would take the closet right here in the corner and I would soundproof it. And I'll talk about that in a second. And then I will close it up so that when I'm recording, I have eliminated as much of the outside sound as I can. And then when I go to edit the recording, I'll sit down at the editing workspace with my computer, which very well may be the same computer that I recorded it on, launch the editing software and go through and clean it up. So how do you insulate or do soundproofing? Believe it or not, you can do it with blankets. You can do it with old egg cartons, not the 12 dozen kind, but the two and a half dozen kind that you can glue on the walls. You can do it with carpeting. You can um, also purchase professional soundproofing baffles. Uh, you can find those online. You can glue those to the wall. You can do all kinds of things, but you don't have to do it in an expensive way. I watched a video not very long ago where a sound engineer tested several different substances for sound absorption and three towels in a framework absorbed sound better than some of the professional materials that you could purchase online. It was kind of crazy, but think about anything that will just muffle the sound, material, cloth, things like that work just fine. I would suppose that uh, quilting batting would also work. A, a good quilt or a thick quilt would probably work pretty well. So you can do some things like that to build a little home studio where you can record. Now remember, we're, we're doing a quick overview of audiobook recording. There's a tremendous amount that you, you can find online and we'll come back to that. But the process of creating an audiobook is the same, whether you record at your home or at, at, a, or at a studio. First, you have to write the manuscript, then you have to test it for narration. And if you were going to a studio, what you would do is you would record the soundtrack and then the studio would do the editing and rework and master the recording and then copy it to a cd or whatever medium you want it to uh, to be distributed in and then if you were to market and sell these cds you would want to have your own website to do it you would also want to sell through amazon.com you would want to sell through books to read.com you would want to sell through audible so that you want to sell through as many uh, venues as you possibly can to maximize your sales. Now, if you're recording at home, there in the middle column where it says recording, you would do the editing and rework yourself as well as the mastering and the copying to a CD. And that of course suggests that you have a learning curve to learn to operate this software. And it can be significant depending on what software you get. It could also be fairly easy if you're using software like Audacity or GarageBand or something like that. But the better the software, the better your recording is going to be. Let's talk about costs. Now, going back to the um, book, the uh, best Christmas pageant ever. It took me six and a half hours to read that. I think we did it in 
uh, two sessions. And the important thing to note is that narrators, professional narrators do not charge by the page in the manuscript, they charge by the hours in the studio. So if you're doing your recording in a studio and you make a lot of mistakes that they have to edit out, that's gonna increase the cost. But if you're editing your own stuff, it's not gonna affect it. This book happens to be in the paperback version. I've got just 80 pages long. So consider that six and a half hours to record 80 pages. Um, there's some work involved in doing that, right? Um, and there's, I, I think I kind of covered these bullet points. Steep learning curve because of the need to learn to do the software, some technical skills required to build a home studio, investment required for editing software and a microphone. A good microphone you can get for $150. A $29 USB microphone is not a good microphone. It's usable, but it's not good for voice work. Just letting you know. Now, if you get good at this and you want to do it, there's a trend afoot to hire untrained narrators because marketers are trying to save money. They don't want to pay the studio costs or they don't want to pay for a voice actor. There's a guy out there named Scott something or other. His last name starts with a B. I, mean, I can't remember what it is. He gets about $10,000 a book for narration. So that can be pretty expensive. So if you can do your own, and you feel comfortable doing it and your audience appreciates your efforts, then that's a, a less expensive way to go by a long shot. So it's kind of a balance between should I try to save money or do I want really high quality, whatever uh, the criteria is. And then the final question you wanna ask yourself is, do I have the energy, the drive, and the finances to learn how to narrate, edit, and produce an audio book. So that's another consideration that you, you want to, to uh, think about, okay? Now, if you've got a pen and paper, you might wanna write down these ideas, but you're gonna get the slide set. But if you just paste these sentences into the Google search bar, you're gonna learn a lot about audiobook narration, how to create an audiobook, how to create an audiobook for Audible, how to create a website, how to market an audiobook, how to get narrator training if you want to spend the money to do that, how to build an in home recording studio. All of this information is available on the internet, and you can go out and do your own research for that. Okay, so now we're at the question point. So I'm going to stop sharing, and Anne, you can allow everybody to talk if they want to ask questions by raising hands or whatever. Okay, they I'm trying to see if anyone has put anything in the chat and I don't see anything. But then okay. last time we had issues with me trying to access chat. So I don't trust, I don't trust my technology. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Craig? That was kind of a fire hose delivery. So if, if He's trying to give us time to, to do our business meeting, right, Craig? <laughs> that is exactly right. So, do you have to go to work this afternoon? No, fortunately, I don't. It looks I'm like, uh, Dwayne, you have a question. Well, I'm just simply impressed with the whole thing because I'd never really thought about it to this extent or even that it was something within the realm of possibility. And so this makes it a possible thing. It gives me enough information to begin thinking about. Good. That's what I'm saying. And I had not had that before. So I don't have any questions because I don't have anything to ask questions about. This is just right. all brand new stuff. Right. It's very common that you don't even know enough to ask a question. Mm -hmm. That's fine. But exactly. Yeah. Go and do your research. That's great. Any other questions? I will mention that I recorded an audio book during lockdown last year because I had nothing but time and uh, had a book of poetry. Uh, I worked with Tracy Million Simmons of Meadowlark Publishers, who was publisher of my book, and she had never recorded an audio book. So we both decided that I would be the guinea pig 
for her project and it was a learning curve. She um, sent me the microphone and the recording device and you were absolutely right about all of the outside noises. Um, every time the air conditioner would cycle on and every time a plane or a siren or the cat would come in and meow or whatever. Um, and you were also right about the different days and the different qualities of voice it didn't always match. And so it, there was a lot of repetition that I would listen sort of like to the day's uh, recordings and say, no, I don't like that one. I'm going to go back and redo it. And then I sent the final product, well, the final rough product to Tracy, and she had the editing software and she put it together. So it is out now as an audio book, Great. whether or not it's a quality piece and whether or not I have the voice that is pleasing enough for people to listen to, that's another matter. But um, it was a long process, mm -hmm. partly because we were both learning and we, we needed to, um, you know, the trial and error, we had to keep, keep working on it. But it was satisfying. It was good to say I have an audio book out there and I have sold a few, so. There you go. Yeah. That's good, congratulations. Now, Fred, you had a question about differences in recording different genres. I don't have a good answer for you on that. Um, maybe I because I haven't done a lot of those different genres. So I guess the story is a story is a story, whether it's fiction or technical or, or what have you, but poetry is special. And I've never recorded poetry, so I, I don't have a good answer for that. Ruth would be your expert on that, right? <laughs> I'm not an expert, but I'd be happy to help with any way I can. There you go. It is harder than you think. Yeah. It does require, it does require a lot of do-overs. Yeah, that's the rework that I mentioned. Connie, you had a question. Well, I... It's kind of a question and a comment. Um, my book that I did during COVID was really a result of the columns I write for the paper every Monday. But then also I, I do public speaking and I, the public speaking that I do um, is my primary interest, okay? And so when you do public speaking, they're always saying, did you write, have you written a book? Yeah. You know, well then yes, now I can say, yes, I have a book. So, but it's interesting what you said about if you're a accomplished public speaker, you know, I would love, and mine are all, all of mine are like 350 word stories or 400 word stories. So I have imagined reading those myself as a recording, but it's every story would end and then a new story would begin. So I don't know if that complicates it or really maybe it make it a little simpler in that if a tone changed or a, if the mood of the article is different, each article has a title, if that, it could possibly make it easier, maybe. Or maybe I, yeah, but it's, it's no different than right than recording individual poems one after the other. Oh, well, that would be true. Yeah. yeah. And each story might lend itself to a different kind of characterization too. Yeah, right. So if you were recharacterizing it, that would eliminate the problem of continuity. So that would be a fun thing for you to try, Connie. Yeah. Let's give it a try. You know, Connie, it, it might work like it does in singing in our Sweet Adeline's group. Our coach, uh, in a piece of music, especially if it's a ballad, she will tell us, okay, in this measure, we go into a different room. So the mood shifts, it changes, you adopt a different tone, you slow down. So I think that might work. And it might, might work with poetry, it might work with your writing as well, so... I agree. 
interesting thoughts. I, and I've been thinking about it just, but I, I think I'd probably want to, well, I'd try it myself first. Right. We'll go for it. <laughs> Doesn't hurt to try. Does not. I think Carol has a, an experience she wants to uh, talk about. If My husband, Max, was known for his humorous fiction. And uh, after his first two or three books were published, uh, someone suggested they should be audiobooks and gave us a lead on a place out in on the West Coast called Books in Motion. And they did audiobooks for people who were truck drivers. Oh, and yeah. boy, if you're a truck driver, you have some time to focus on listening, you know. <laughs> and so he did the first two novels as audiobooks. And Max passed away in 2017. But I have always listened to those. And I love to walk and listen. And he absolutely nailed Max's work and his sense of humor and everything about it. And I was so impressed. It was like he was in Max's heart and understood absolutely what was going on. Uh, I had no way of contacting him or telling him anything for quite a while, but I finally online found a, a way to send an email to him. So I did that and I said, I'm the widow of Max Yoho, you may remember blank, blank, you know. And uh, I just want you to know, I think you did a super job. He wrote me back and he said, I'm honored uh, that you have contacted me, yeah. but I want, that, I want you to know something. And that is I'm a professional narrator and I've done lots, many, many, many books, but that book was the hardest one I'd ever worked on. And I said, you know, I said, why is that? And he said, because I'd be speaking. I knew what was coming the whole bit, but I would start to laugh. <laughs> and any time I started to laugh, I'd have to stop, <laughs> go back and do it again. So I guess there was a lot of editing involved. Anyway, uh, the, the sound version of that stuff just, it lives on and it's wonderful. Yay, Max! Yay, Max! <laughs> uh, Dwayne, you've got your hand up. Not Dwayne Herman, but the other Dwayne. Dwayne John. I wonder if you have an opinion on, in terms of comparison, on the various systems that come with computers, for example, the audio quality of iMovies on an iMac um, versus a regular computer like are you familiar with iMovies vaguely but let me answer it this way most of the professional media work is done on apples these days on the apple machines because they seem to lend themselves to editing and and it doesn't matter whether it's documents or whether it's audio or movies or whatever Apple seems to lend itself to that much better than Windows machines. Would you agree with that, Anne? I do. Uh, yeah. the, the recording studios that you will see always have, have Macs in them. Yeah. All righty. We're at about 10 minutes to two. I think that uh, we've had a lot of fun here. I've enjoyed being with you. I've, uh, I've enjoyed your questions. I appreciate your patience with me and my stuttering <laughs> and so I'm gonna I'm gonna bow out now and and uh, if you have any additional questions send it to me through Anne that last slide has my contact information on it as well and I will get those slides uh out to you all uh if you will let me know that you want a copy of them or I will I will just make them available to you so just okay. uh, thank you very much, Craig. Really appreciate it. I think you've given us all something to think about. So thank you so much. Thanks a thank lot. You. All right. Talk See you to later. you soon, maybe about something else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye bye.